Welcome back everyone. Today I'm going to be analyzing 10 paintings from 10 different artists all centered around St. George and the Dragon. Now if you're not familiar with St. George and the Dragon, that's okay. I'm sure you've seen it many, many, many times in popular media. It's a very, very old archetypical story and image. It goes back to medieval texts. There's plenty of Renaissance renditions that we'll, we'll walk through a couple of them today in paintings. And in popular media, you'll see it everywhere. So a couple examples of that. Sleeping Beauty is a direct reference to St. George and the Dragon. Um, Bilbo in The Hobbit, when he has to go get the gold from Smog, that's St. George and the Dragon. Or Harry Potter, when Harry has to rescue Jenny from the Chamber of Secrets and the Basilisk, that is also St. George and the Dragon. So you guys have seen it many, many places. And after this video, hopefully you'll see it more and more often um, in popular media. But before we get into that today, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps boost this channel and the algorithm, and I appreciate it a lot. But yeah, let's jump into the first painting. So, our first painting is from Staraya Ladoga, Russia. I hope I'm not completely butchering that, even though I probably am. I'm trying to learn Russian right now, but it is very difficult when you don't have anybody to speak it with. Anyways, I wanted to start with this painting, as you see here. I'm sorry it's not the most beautiful or the most detailed painting, but the ones we talk about after this are much more appealing to the eye. But I wanted to start with the first rendition of St. George and the Dragon, and this, to my knowledge, is it. So it was painted in the, in the 12th century in a chapel, and there's a couple interesting things about it. So the first thing I'll mention is the angel with the scythe in the bottom right-hand corner here. Now, what does this angel symbolize? Well, it's an angel, so there's obviously death and rebirth being symbolized here. It's also a child, so there's a childlike innocence being symbolized here. But why? Why is there an angel with a scythe around the neck of the dragon and why isn't it Prince George fighting the dragon like we'll see in the other paintings? Well, I think this is representing divine intervention. Divine intervention is a very common theme in stories. Usually towards the end of a story, the hero will have kind of nature and the divine, the eternal kind of take its place on the side of the hero and help it through its journey. But in here, I think it's a little bit on the nose. It's a little bit too obvious. There's a reason why this angel won't pop up again, and it's because you can't tell people that if they do everything right, that God will intervene and do things for them. That's not how the world works. You can have all your morals and virtues aligned properly, and you can be going down the straight and narrow path, and still things don't work out for you. And I think that's a reason why this angel won't pop up again. Now, what else do I want to highlight in this particular piece? Well, the halo. The halo you see around St. George's head here comes up in a lot of renditions because this symbolizes the divine favor, right? This is what I was just talking about, the divine intervention and the divine favor when God's on your side. But you also have to align yourself with God. And it's also spiritual enlightenment. That's what the halo also represents. So our St. George, our hero here, is a spiritually enlightened person. And also St. George, right? Saints are usually depicted with halos around their head. So you'll notice the halo pop up quite a bit. And then we have the red cape. Now you might say, well, how, how interesting could the red cape be? You know, that seems pretty arbitrary. But that will come up multiple times in these paintings. You'll see a red cape. It's always red. Now the, the reason why it's red is because red symbolizes courage, right? You know, our hero, St. George here, has to find the courage within to go and fight the dragon. So that's symbolized in the red shading of the cape. The red also symbolizes love. Now, in this rendition, we don't have a princess, but usually there's a princess hidden somewhere in the image because that's what the dragon guards. The dragon guards gold and or a princess, right? That's hearkening back to what I was saying about the, the um, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, right? Jenny is the, is the virgin in that case. But anyways, the red symbolizes love in the cape. It also, sacri it also symbolizes sacrifice, um, because of, you know, red and blood and all of that. You usually have to make a sacrifice at some point on your journey. And the red also symbolizes the divine intervention and grace. Um, you can see the divine in sort of like how wavy the cape is, right? It's got this like chaotic nature to it. So it's almost representing the anima or, or the chaotic, the, the chaotic divine in a way. Anyways, I hope that's not too confusing. And then we have the white horse, right? The white horse, again, you might say, well... 
Why is a white horse significant? Well, a horse is significant for a couple of reasons. One, it symbolizes strength. So when you see statues of great leaders, you know, like Napoleon and stuff, you'll see them oftentimes on the back of a horse, and the horse will be on its back two legs, kind of stouted up in a, in a stance that really symbolizes strength. It's a, it's a strong symbol. It's also victory, right? That's why you see all these, like, statues of Napoleon and stuff that symbolizes victory, the horse. Horse also symbolizes freedom. That's the animal that usually comes to mind when we think of freedom. That's the one we associate with freedom. The horse is also white because the white part of the horse symbolizes purity, nobility, and divinity. So those three things are symbolized in the horse being white. And you'll notice through all of these paintings, the horse is always white. Now, what else does the horse represent? Well, it represents the beast, right? The prince here, or St. George, has mastery over the beast. So he's conquered the beast in the external world. He has mastery over nature. But he also has mastery over his internal beast. Right? That's also being symbolized here with his mastery of the horse. So he's mastered his internal shadow, his internal beast. The horse, lastly, symbolizes the anima. Because as I just said, the horse is representative of nature. So the anima, which is the internal feminine, anima also means soul. That's what the word actually means. But when we're archetypically analyzing things, we use anima to, to describe the internal feminine, sometimes the external feminine, but usually the internal feminine. And that's represented here in the horse as well. So all of that is baked into this image. And all of that is going to come up Many, many times again, you'll see the red cape, you'll see the halo, and you'll see the white horse, and you'll see the dragon. And you'll, you'll, you'll notice that the dragon right now is underneath the horse's hoof. It's underneath the prince. It's underneath, underneath the self, self. That's because the dragon is the underworld, right? That's hell. That's the beast, the monster. And it's green, bluish color in this painting, right? It's more of a blue, but... The dragon is usually green because, like I said in the Lion King analysis video and the Sleeping Beauty analysis video, that green oftentimes is the color that is representative of evil. So, so the little angel child here you won't see again, but you'll see all those other symbols. And you'll also see this um, castle too. It's a little bit cut off in this image on the right side, but you'll see the castle pop up again too. So take note of all of that. And let's move on to the next painting. So our next painting here is by Raphael. Many of you may know him. He was one of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, but he's also one of the greatest painters of all time. He lived from 1483 to 1520, so he died at 37 years old. And you might say, well, isn't that the average age expectancy back then? And it was, but that's because most people died in childbirth or, or in infancy. So once you hit about 35, once you hit about 25 around that age, you actually had a pretty, pretty good chance of living to 75, um, like we'll see with many other painters on this list. This is actually the, the shortest lifespan we'll get, so he died kind of tragically at a young age. And this painting here was painted in 1505, and it is absolutely stunning. <laughs> Obviously, much more artistically thought out, I guess, and, and, and played out than, than the last painting I showed you, but that's just because of the evolution of art over the last, you know, how, however many centuries we, we went from the last painting till this one. So the technical brilliance here from, from Raphael is really, I mean, look at just the super fine details, especially on the halo. You look at how discreet that halo is, right? It's super fine. And all the super smooth edges, you look at the horse's butt, right? <laughs> the horse has like a pretty nice butt. I, <laughs> I know that that's like a weird thing to analyze, but it's got a really smooth butt. And it's kind of looking back at him kind of gaily. There might be something sexual going on there with the horse. I don't know. It's a little bit weird. But anyways, the colors in this are super modest and elegant. And just the whole painting is very, very well painted. Now, there's a couple things in this painting that I want to talk about that are unique. So the first thing is I want to talk about the dragon now. It's about time I talk about the dragon. It's a big part of the painting, right? So what does the dragon symbolize? Well, the dragon symbolizes chaos. It symbolizes the unknown. It symbolizes death, evil, the shadow, the beast. All of those things are encapsulated in the dragon. The dragon is, the, is what you face. That's the thing that you go out in the unknown to face, right? So what else is the dragon? Why does the dragon look like that you know what wh why would it look like that why would it have wings why would it breathe fire none of that really makes sense on its surface but it does make sense it makes a deep deep amount of sense so the dragon is a couple things first of all 
it's got four legs. Sometimes it has two legs, but usually has four legs, and they have these like claw-like talons at the end of them. So the dragon is a cat. It's a predatory cat. But it's not just a cat because it has, a, it has scales, and it has a serpent-like tail, and sometimes it even has an alligator jaw. So it's also a predatory reptile. But it's not only a predatory reptile because it has wings. It flies. So it's also a predatory bird. And those are the three things that preyed on us when we were evolving in the open savanna. It was big cats, big snakes, big birds, right? Big felines, big reptiles, big birds. That's the things, those were the things that hunted us. Now, that wasn't the only thing that we had to deal with in the open savanna. We also had to deal with lightning strikes that would cause big open flames that would burn, you know, miles and miles of dead grass. It, it was chaotic. It looked like hell. And if you get trapped in the middle of that, you're just dead. And we had to face that a lot in the open savanna, so that's why it's also a fire-breathing dragon. So it's a big cat-snake bird that breathes fire, so that all makes sense. That's all the stuff that we had to deal with, you know, evolving. Those were the things that scared us. And it's, it also hoards, so that's another weird thing, right? It hoards gold, it hoards the virgin. I think that that's the seven deadly sins, you know, greed and gluttony and all those things kind of combined into one. It's more of a human trait that we give the dragon, but that's what makes it more dynamic. If it was just an animalistic thing that we were fighting, it, would, it wouldn't be complete. The fact that we give it these human characteristics as hoarding gold or hoarding the virgin, that makes it more human, it makes it more complete. Next, I want to talk about the princess. So you see the princess over here on the right. She obviously symbolizes the anima, so the internal feminine. But she's not just the internal feminine. She's also the virgin, the wife, the love interest, the princess. She's what you get when you face the dragons. When you face dragons, when you become a stronger human being, when you become a hero, you know, when you become a true prince, then maybe you merit having a true princess. So you have to go through fighting the dragon to get the princess. That makes complete sense. You can't just go out in the world and expect to have a beautiful girl present herself to you and, and you're just going to fall in love right away, right away, right? You have to go out in the world. You have to face tasks. You have to learn things. You have to conquer evil. You have to develop character. And then maybe you'll become man enough to actually deserve a princess. So, so that's all symbolized there. There's also salvation and redemption. When you go on a journey to face a dragon, you're going to you're going to hit pitfalls. You're going to, you know, hit bumps along the way. I think Nietzsche said, you know, when you fight dragons, be, care be careful you don't become one. And that can happen. You know, you can do evil things along the way. You can still redeem yourself. And that redemption and salvation is symbolized in the princess. But that's part of the journey as well. So the princess represents all of that. And obviously the soul, the divine feminine, mother nature, it's all kind of represented there in the princess. And then we have the lance. So the lance is interesting, right? Because you could have any weapon for St. George or the prince. But wh what weapon would you choose? A bow and arrow, a sword, an axe, a mace? No, a lance. A lance makes the most sense because it's a skilled weapon. It's the weapon that takes the most skill to use out of all the ones I just mentioned. And it's precise. It's accurate. It's a one-hit tool. So you don't have to hack and slash. So when you face evil in the world... You don't want to be any more malice than you need to. You know, not all, not all killings are murder. So sometimes, sometimes in the world, you are pushed to a point where you have to take another person's life. It's very, very rare, especially in today's society. But sometimes that happens, you know, a home burglary or something. There's situations where that might happen. When that does happen, you as a hero, as a prince, as St. George... You are supposed to take that person out as quickly and as effectively as you possibly can. No hacking and slashing, right? No extra blows. So that's all symbolized in the, in the use of a lance. Beautiful symb symbolism there. And then, like I said, the halo on the prince's head is super discreet. Um, I, I really like that. I like how it's super minimal. The horse, um, yeah, I don't really know what to make of the horse. You guys can tell me what you guys think. The way he's looking back at the at St. George here is, um, <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, the light shimmering off of the armor also is another detail that I, I think is really, really well done. Anyways, let's move on to the next painting. So next up, we have this painting by Paolo Uccello. He was from Italy, as most of these painters are. You'll find it a common theme that most of the greatest painters of all time are from Italy. So shout out to you guys. 
Pablo lived from 1397 to 1475. And when you take a look at this painting, this does not look <laughs> like a 1400s painting. Like, this is very, very well done. Um, there's a lot here. So there's a couple new things to analyze in this painting. So here we have the cave, right? This wasn't in the previous two. What does the cave symbolize? Well, that is the realm of chaos. That's the realm of the unknown, of darkness, right? The monster, the dragon, that's the beast that lives within that. That's that animated. But that itself, chaos itself, is the cave. That's the underworld. It's the gateway into hell. That's all symbolized here in the cave. And the cave is really cool looking here, right? It's, it's jaggedy and, and sharp and almost looks like a mouth in, in ways and super dark inside. So the cave is interesting. And then we also have the storm building up behind the prince here. And that it's kind of mirroring the cave. So what is the storm? Well, the storm is the internal struggle and the internal conflict. Like I said before, sometimes on your journey, you will fall, you will stumble, you will do evil things yourself. And that's the internal struggle. That's the internal storm. But it's not just that. It's also divine wrath and divine intervention. Like I said, towards the end of a story, you'll notice this when you watch um, lots of di animated Disney films. You'll notice this. Towards the end of the film, nature and the divine will kind of rally behind our hero. And that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing the wind, right? Nature and the divine rallying behind the hero. And that also symbolizes wind in the sails. So when you're on a journey, when you're on a horse, you know, you're, you're going down paths and, and pursuing an adventure, you're building wind in your sails. You're, you're getting faster and faster and building momentum. And you need that momentum when you face a dragon because a dragon is truly terrible, terrifying and evil. So you need that momentum going into that battle. And that's symbolized in the storm building up behind the prince. And then we have the chain, and the chain is so interesting. This is, this is probably the most interesting part of the video here, because the chain perplexes me. Because look at the princess. She's not, like, running away. She's not, like, cowering. She's kind of just standing there pretty peacefully, and she's chained to the dragon. And the dragon's, like, not even two feet from her. So what does that symbolize? Well, obviously, obviously it's subjugation to tyranny, right? The, the princess is subjugated to the tyranny of the dragon, She's being chained to it. She is possession of the dragon. But it's not just that. It's more complex than that. This is also a connection between the chaos and the anima, between the eternal feminine and chaos, right? Femininity is, is in the chaotic realm, whereas masculinity is in the order realm. And I can get into the reasons for that in a separate video. It's super complicated, so I don't want to unpack it here. But that's that's how it works, right? The The... The anima or the eternal feminine is linked with chaos, with desire, with negative emotions and destructive behavior, right? Those are the evil parts of femininity, self-destruction, negative emotions and, and desire. So that's all baked in here with her being chained to the dragon, but it not being, um, her not being like scared or recoiled by it. It's super interesting. And then you see the, the dragon's bleeding here a bit. It's got some circles on the wings. I don't exactly know what to make of that, but you guys can let me know down below. And I just think that this is a tremendous, tremendous painting, especially for the time it, it, um, it was painted. So, so let's move on to the next one. So our next painting is by Bernat Motorel. He's a Spanish painter, and this was painted in 1435. And if you look at it here, it is done in that kind of 1400 style, but it's very, very well done. There's a couple things here that are super interesting. So obviously we get the castle in the background. Now, what does the castle symbolize? Well, that's order, right? That's order. That's the kingdom. That's heaven. That's what awaits. So when the prince faces his battle and he defeats the dragon and he gets the princess and he finds the gold, where does he go? He goes back to the kingdom. Now, what else does the kingdom represent? Well, it's also the soul and the body, right? The kingdom, the cathedral, the temple, the church, all of these things symbolize the soul and the body. And it also symbolizes hope because all these people are being terrorized by this dragon and you can see their little faces, probably not um, on your screen, but if you zoom in on this painting, if you go find it online, you can see all their little faces are like in shock and dismay because um, they're being terrorized by this dragon, so there's hope there, right? They're hoping that this prince rallies through and defeats the dragon. So that's all symbolized in the castle. And then we have the black armor. So why black armor? That's so interesting, right? 
why would it be black armor? Not Why not white armor? Like, he is a little bit of white in here, and we'll talk about that in a second, but why not white armor or red armor or blue armor? Why black? Why, why is such a menacing color? Well, that's because it symbolizes his integration with the shadow. He's integrated his internal beast, right? The white crest on the front here, right? That, that white on the, on the right side of him, shows his pure heart. So it's kind of like a yin-yang symbol, you can think of it, right? He's like all black with a little bit of white. And that, that black armor shows his capability for danger, for, for maleficence, right? He's capable of, of violence. And, and you need that. You need to be able to be a monster if you're going to defeat a monster. It's kind of the reverse of what I just said. When you be careful in fighting monsters, lest you become one, well, you have to become somewhat of a monster to face a monster. So... So that's all symbolized in the black armor. That's becoming, you know, becoming a true warrior, becoming truly capable of violence and integrating that with a pure heart. Um, and then we also have the lamb here in the back, right behind the princess. You see it off to the right here. The lamb symbolizes virtue and purity. Obviously being a, a white, pure lamb, right? It's also innocence. But it's also a sacrifice, because sometimes along your journey, you will have to make sacrifices. Sometimes people will die, as we'll see in this next painting. But sometimes people will die, and sometimes you will have to make sacrifices yourself that you don't want to make, and that's all symbolized in the lamb here. Now, it's also divine protection. You know, the lamb of God and all that stuff, it's divine protection. It's also victory. You know, at the end of a war, at the end of a battle, sometimes you'll trade lambs or you'll cut up a lamb to eat. So that's all symbolized in victory. And then we have the pink dress of the princess. Now, why pink? Why a pink dress, right? Everything matters. No detail is, is done by accident. But why pink? Well, if you remember in my Sleeping Beauty analysis video... You'll know exactly why it's a pink dress, but the pink represents femininity, beauty, vulnerability, and innocence. So that's half of the female, right? That's, that's not the totality of femininity, but it is the more feminine part of it, I guess you could say. So it's beauty, vulnerability, and innocence is all represented in the dress being pink. And we'll see um, a more complete version of that in this next painting. So, in our next painting, this one is by Tin Tortoretto. He lived from 1518 to 1594, so 75 years old, and he was from Italy as well. And if you check this one out, this is absolutely the most beautiful painting I'm probably going to show you today. I mean, it is stunning, right? I could break this down from kind of an artistic perspective, but I won't. I'll just I'll save it for another day. I'll just do the symbolism for right now. But obviously, you see heaven, right? In the top of the painting here, this is obviously heaven. So that's divine intervention, heaven itself. It's the light, right? It's what we're aiming at. It's the highest possible good. But it's also the ghost of the dead because you see in the middle of the painting here, right in the middle, you see somebody who's lying dead. And I think that the ghost of the dead is up in heaven. But what does the dead man represent? Because that's interesting. Well, I think the dead man could either be the dead brother or it could be the dead father. Both are archetypes throughout stories. Sometimes the father passes away. Sometimes it's the brother. I'm not too sure what to make of it, but it is symbolizing human frag fragility and mortality here, right? Somebody has perished in the conquest of the dragon, and now it's time for St. George or the prince to come in and to redeem that person who has fallen. And that's all symbolized here in, in the person who's lying dead in front of the dragon. And then I want to talk about the prince real or the princess real quickly because here she has the pink and the blue. So if you remember in Sleeping Beauty, in the beginning of the story, the fairies can't decide on the dress color. They keep going back from red to blue. And it's kind of causing some chaos and some havoc. And that's because Princess Beauty or um <laughs> Princess Beauty, Sleeping Beauty hasn't fully integrated both of her both of her sides of her femininity or her anima and her animus, right? That's I went through all of that in the Sleeping Beauty analysis. You can go check that out. But the reason why at the end of the film, um, the changing of the dresses no longer means that is because it's done in a synchronicity, right? The, the dresses are changing at the end of Sleeping Beauty, synchronized to the music. They're in a dance. So you can see that it's integrated. She's integrated both the blue and the pink. Both sides of her femininity are integrated now at the end of the film. And that's what you see here in this painting. You see a princess who is fully integrated. She has the pink and the blue. So the pink, like I just said before, femininity, beauty, 
compassion, tenderness. What is blue? Blue is the wisdom. That's the spirituality. That's the strength, right? The strength of women. That's all symbolized in the blue. It's the more masculine aspects, the more animus aspects, right? And that's what Sleeping Beauty does. That's what Aurora does throughout Sleeping Beauty. She goes and she integrates her animus with her anima. Anyways, that's all symbolized here in the dress being pink and blue. There's a reason why those colors matter. Let's move on to the next painting. So our next painting is by Carlo Crivelli, and he lived from 1430 to 1495, so 65 years old. And there's only one thing that I really want to talk about in this painting. And if you look at it, everything's pretty much the same. You have the princess over here. It's kind of small in the back um, left side here of the, of the painting, just underneath the castle. You got the castle, the trees, and the winding road. I'll talk about the winding road in the next painting. But the interesting thing about this one is you'll notice that the lance is broken, right? The lance is kind of stuck in the jaw of the dragon, and he's taken out his sword... And now he's using a different weapon. So that kind of goes against what I said in the, in the second painting. So why is that? Well, this kind of symbolizes the diversity of attack and the diversity of knowledge, which is what you have to do. And I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent here, but I'm going to explain to you guys the, the philosophy or the psychology, I guess, of pyramids and obelisks. So an obelisk is straight up and down, right? You build basically the same size at the bottom that you do at the top and it narrows off a little bit but that's basically an obelisk right it's a straight beam up and down it's like a pole and you can find obelisks everywhere egyptian obelisks everywhere on the planet you find them in india you see them in in china all over europe there's some in africa they're all over the place right because people have taken them all around the world there's obelisks everywhere now what does that mean? It means that you can be manipulated and moved if you just focus on one thing. If you just build yourself up from one skill, you only use a lance or you only learn one thing, you'll be able to be manipulated like like mad because you're you're one thing. But if you're a, if you think of the pyramids, where are the pyramids? They're only in Giza, they're only in Egypt. Now I know that there's pyramids all over the world, and I'll get to that in a second, but why haven't the pyramids moved? Because you can't move them. They're unmovable. And that's because the base is wide. Because they've learned so many, because you learn so many things, you develop a wide base, right? You learn as many things as you possibly can. And then from there, you find the things that you have a slight talent for. And then you focus on those things. And that's the second level of the pyramid. And then from there, you find the things that you're really talented at and you focus on those things. And then you go up and up and up until you get to like four or maybe one thing that you're like the best in the world at, that you're absolutely amazing at. And you can get to a higher point, right? The pyramids are taller than any obelisk because they have a wide base. So when you build that wide base, not only do you have a sturdier structure, right, as a person, as a human being, but you can also build yourself higher up. So all of that is, is symbolized in the pyramids and the obelisks, right? That's kind of like the psychology or the philosophy of them, is to build a wide base, is to learn as many things as you possibly can. So that's symbolized here with the lance breaking and him switching to the sword, right? It's a diversity in, ta in attack and a diversity in knowledge. So I find that really, really cool. And then on to the next painting. So in this next painting by Andrea Mantenega, hopefully I'm not butchering that too badly, he, w he lived from 1431 to 1506, so 75 years old. And this particular painting was painted in 1460. So if you take a look at it, it's quite different from all the other ones I've shown you guys. Um, he's already conquered the dragon. The lance is broken. And there's really only two things to point out that are unique about it. So at the top, you see the fruits, right? That's the fruits of victory. That's what you get when you, when you win. It's the fruits of victory. It's a little bit plain, but, but what's the second thing? The second thing is the winding road. I, I mentioned that before. And it's interesting because the dragon is already vanquished. It's already at the feet of the hero. But you see the winding road. And that symbolizes the long journey that it took to get to the dragon. So you don't just start at the dragon. Like I said before, you have to build up the momentum. You have to go on the adventure. You have to go on the journey. And eventually, you'll find a dragon that you have to face and you have to defeat. But that journey, that's a big part of the process. So this painting is kind of reflecting on that. It's reflecting on the long road he took to get to the dragon. And let's look at the next one here. 
So next up, we have this painting by Roger van der Weinen, who lived from 1400 to 1464. And he was born in the Netherlands. And the only thing I really want to say about this painting is that it is superbly detailed and mapped, like mapped out for a painting that was painted in 1435. I just think that it's a tremendous painting for the era that it came out of. The castle is super detailed in the background. Um, the red cape is here. The, the light shimmering off the armor is really nice. The dragon and doesn't fully look like a dragon, but looks more like a lizard, but still cool. And I think it's just a very detailed, nice painting. I don't have anything really to comment on this. Nothing that's too new or stands out to me. So I'll move on to the last or to the last two. Next up, we have this painting by Peter Paul Rubens, and it might be my favorite painting of all time. It's definitely up there, and if you look at the logo for this channel, not the banner, but the logo, this is the painting in the background. It's kind of in black and white, but um, it's one of my favorite paintings of all time. So Peter Paul Rubens lived from 1577 to 1640. He was Flemish, born in Germany, and he painted this in 1607. Now, if you take a look at it, it is absolutely stunning. <laughs> One of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen in my life. The details, the shadows, the colors, and how much they pop. The contrast. I mean, this is an example in contrast if there's any. And just everything about it, I think, is just perfectly staged, perfectly planned out. Um, the prince looks, or St. George looks more badass than in any other painting we've looked at so far. The head ornament is, like, super intricate. The, the horse has this wavy-like hair. I love it. Like, St. George looks super sick in this. And then if you look down at the bottom, this is the real interesting part of the painting. I don't even know if this is a dragon. It's more like a, an abomination of nature. It's an absolute beast. So you see it's, what, it's uh, yellow piercing eyes, right? That really captures your eye right away. And then you see a little bit up to the right, you see this hand that almost looks like a human hand pulling the, the lance out of, out of its nose. And if you look at the bottom, you see the wings are much like eagle's wings or like a sphinx wings. Like they're, they're very interesting. And then you look at the, at the romp, right, at the butt here. And it's kind of spotted. It looks almost like a jaguar. And then you look at the tail and how the tail wraps up and coils kind of close to the horse's neck here. If you look just to the right of the horse's neck, you'll see the serpent-like tail. So this really is like an abomination of a bunch of different animals. And I think it's so cool because it really brings out the chaos and it really brings out like just the, the true evilness of this beast. And I think that this painting is just, I'd love to get this framed one day because even though I will never be able to afford the original, um, I would love to have this piece of art in my house. I think it's absolutely beautiful. I should have saved it for last, but I saved for last the newest painting and let's move on to that one. So the last painting that we have is by Gustave Moreau. He lived from 1826 to 1898, so 72 years old. He's from Paris, and this painting was painted in 1889, which is actually when the Eiffel Tower was finished being constructed, when Adolf Hitler was born, Nintendo was founded, and Coca-Cola was founded. I believe all those facts are correct. You guys can go fact check me. But I think all of those things happened in 1889. Um, I think I remember that from a Vsauce video. So shout out, Michael. This painting is not done in the, in the same style as we saw the last ones. The last ones are more like Renaissance or like 1400s. This is more neoclassical. But the colors in this are absolutely stunning. So you see like the red lance, right? And the capes kind of going around the lance, um, the lance here. And, and the red really plays off of the white of the horse really well. And that plays off of the black armor really well. And that plays off of the yellow halo really well. So all four of those colors just work amazingly right in the center of the image. And if you look down at the dragon, not only is he bleeding from his mouth, but the colors are kind of bleeding on him too. So that's really cool. There's like a chaotic element to the dragon here. And it's kind of looking up as, as, as it's being vanquished. And then you see the, the princess here. She's sitting on, on the rocks looking up, right? She's looking up towards the heavens, towards the divine. And then right behind her is the castle. And I just think everything's really well laid out in this, in this painting. I think it's probably the second or third most beautiful painting we've looked at today. It's absolutely stunning. And um, it's actually my wallpaper on my phone right now. So, yeah. Um, that pretty much concludes my analysis of St. George and the Dragon. There's not really any 
particular artistic elements I want to point out or analyze in any more detail than that. But I would like to know in the comments, what paintings do you guys want me to do next? Do you guys want me to focus on a specific painting and just dive into one painting in, in a lot of detail? Or do you guys want me to do another archetype or another story like... Um, like maybe the Madonna and Child, there's a lot of great renditions of that. Or, or The Last Supper, or maybe some Greek mythology stuff. You guys can let me know in the comments and I'll definitely get around to that. I could also do a part two to St. George and the Dragon. There are hundreds of renditions of St. George and the Dragon. So many beautiful ones out there. Um, I just picked my 10 favorites for today. But yeah, I hope, I hope this was um, educational, or if not, entertaining. But yeah, I learned a lot in doing this video and analyzing these paintings in more depth. And it, it's... Um, it's a reoccurring theme that I see a lot in my favorite stories of all time. And, and I love these paintings. You know, I use them for wallpapers all the time because the, the symbolism is just so strong and it just it speaks to my soul, you know. So, so yeah, that's everything for me to, for today, guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. It means the world to me. Um, don't forget to like and subscribe. It helps boost this channel and the algorithm. I'll catch you guys in the next one.